today is definitely deep, so. Can you guys hear leaf blowers? No. Right. If it starts getting loud, tell me and I'll shut my windows. But... So there is no uh, class call up for today, right? Um, Correct. I'm going to show stuff, but I'm not going to. Okay. A little too much to run. Having everybody boot up GPU instances in the middle of lecture, it seems like maybe not quite as good. Although it's so awesome that it's possible. All right, maybe I'm good to start. Okay, welcome back. We're getting deep today. Um, it's time to talk about deep learning. So let me um, let me do a little philosophy first. So um, deep learning is such a powerful set of tools. It's like such a good thing to know. And these days it's so central to manipulation research. We're definitely gonna spend some time on it in the class. Um, it's a really frustrating thing to teach, <laughs> just so you know. Um, you know, partly because I think just even looking across the screen, I think some of you maybe have never done it, actually done it. I mean, I, I think everybody knows what it is roughly, but I think uh, some people haven't actually, you know, trained a deep network. Um, other people might have some uh, some training session happening on a cloud instance right now. Um, so there's a, just a huge diversity of, of experiences. Um, but also, I, you know, there's, there's things, there's so much to know details wise and um, a little bit less of like the fundamental principles just because it's young and we're still, we're still learning them. So I'm gonna try to find that balance today. I'll do my best. Um, please ask as many questions as you want. I wanna try to give you the, you know, the important ideas. I'm going to try to give you everything we can sort of know about it. And I'm going to try to not talk about like the details of the architecture or other pieces that might change in a year. Okay, so um, so far in class, we have talked a lot about um, perception in terms of geometry, right? And uh, we've been simulating RGBD cameras, but it's kind of funny that we've so far just ignored the RGB Right? There's nothing we've done so far that actually has used the, the color channels, right? Um, but it's, it's more than that. Today is more, it's, it's not just about using the color channels, although that is a big part of it because the color is very, very valuable source of information. But there's also just a lot of properties of the scene that um, the geometry, instantaneous snapshots of the geometry, the point cloud doesn't tell me everything there is to know. And we got a little taste of that um, at the end of last time, right? So uh, I guess this the video came in so fast, but the you know the the different scenarios where this thing failed, right? If I can, um, you know, this was the the two two boxes sort of uh, up up against each other, and um, 
<clears throat> I'll draw it in just a second. But there are things about the scene that basically geometry doesn't tell you. Let me actually just go ahead and draw that now. Okay, so imagine I have, um, you know, two boxes in my scene and they both have these little tabs on there because, you know, we like to hang them on shelves in the drugstore and they just happen to be aligned like this in the, in the bin, right? And the double pick scenario that I showed you in that was that the hand came down and, and thought this was a good antipodal grasp to just, you know, come in like this because there's really no way from the point cloud, especially if those are arbitrarily close, that, you know, there's no sort of geometric principle that tells me somehow that that's two objects and I shouldn't, I shouldn't pick those as one, right? And uh, I think, it, you know, you could try to write heuristics that would try to break that up. But at some point, there's something in your head, you know, if, if I showed you a point cloud of this, you would know, even without any color values, you would know that those are two objects because you have lots and lots of experiences of, of what objects look like, right, over, over time. And somehow you have this accumulated knowledge of, um, that brings in prior information, which causes you to interpret the scene differently. So, um, so getting to, to deep perception or even data-driven, let's call it perception, um, is really, you know, when we're bringing in learning, we're bringing in the ability to, to think about things like that, right? So, um, you know, learning provides sort of a fundamental approach, right? To bring in sort of the statistics of um, objects into our grasping heuristics, right? Now, the interesting thing is, um, you know, we don't have to solve general AI in order to understand what the objects are, right? We don't have to have some meaningful, um, you know, perfect, uh, you know, human level of understanding of objects in order for this task. If you just generate enough scenes with labeled objects, right, um, and they tend to have geometries like this, then a relatively simple statistical algorithm could infer something more about the geometry than our point, simple point cloud approximation so far could, right? So it really, I think, is an important, different approach, a, sep, uh, a very valuable approach, even in the pure geometry world, just using data, right? But, um, and you know, and many of many, I think there are many things in this sort of middle ground. Now learning from RGB Is it is in is incredibly important. Um, in, it's like the the super uh, important thing uh, pieces of information that we weren't using in our point cloud processing. I mean, there are little ways where you can use them. You could try to use color values to try to help your correspondence matching and stuff like this. But it's it's not a central role. Like the fact that the cheese it box is written in bright colors, cheese it somehow is this super valuable bit of information that we so far haven't used yet. Um, but the RGB, you know, making use of those RGB values is has required an incredible um, advance in in machine learning and in the amount of data we've had in order to really take advantage of that, right? Um, you know, in classical computer vision, classical like ten years old, right? Computer vision, people used used to try to write. Um, you know, features based on RGB values that are, that would detect, well, edges, for instance, is, is doesn't even require RGB, but some color values could tell you something about edges in your images. You can talk about surf and SIF features. And there's all these, this, all this work where people try to hand design feature vectors that would make good on RGB information. And basically all of that has now been eclipsed by, uh, by deep learning approaches where we learn features based on RGB. And that seems to be, um, you know, once we got enough RGB data in the world, um, then th it seems to just be hard to beat. Um,
you guys all know that. That's yeah. Um, <clears throat> but it takes a ton of data, right? Uh, super, super intensive, uh, data hungry. Labeled data. The type of learning we're going to talk about today is a supervised learning. So it requires, um, you know, input output data, a training data that has been labeled with the ground truth information that we want. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting. I think most people, there, there are plenty of places online if you don't, haven't seen the history of, of sort of ImageNet and, and the like. And in fact, I, even in the notes, I, I linked, there was a nice talk that Fei-Fei Li gave at one of the robotics uh, conferences recently that was kind of with a little bit of a robotic spent talking about the history of, of the big data sets. But ImageNet is the most famous of all now. It is the data set that sort of broke open the deep learning um, uh, success and the deep learning revolution. And the story of that, um, it's sort of very interesting. Maybe, maybe the little bit that I can contribute that is harder to find on the, on the web. Um, I watched uh, at, at MIT, we have a very incredibly strong computer vision group at MIT. And um, I watched the early pieces of that happen. And I remember um, Antonio Taralba, for instance, had a, has had a huge impact in this field. And roughly what happened was, um, you know, Antonio and others like it were started making annotation tools that made it more possible to, uh, first of all, people started agreeing on, on the basic uh, problems in machine, in computer vision about just first labeling an uh, image as whether there's an object inside it or not. And then object detection saying we're trying to find a bounding box around it and then eventually segmentation but we're going to talk about those a little bit more carefully um, but a lot of that required human labeling of images and um, antonio was like really in the the leading edge of people that were trying to make labeling uh, easier so that you could get bigger data sets and then amazon mechanical turk came around and i remember um, watching the initial you know uh, research talks about people who said, you know what, I just paid people a penny per image and they just labeled a boatload of data for me. And, and uh, Antonio in particular had a system called Label Me that was extremely good. It made it easier for people to make almost pixel wise annotations on images. And uh, he, I remember him telling a story that uh, they looked at the statistics of all these people that had, uh, had applied labels to their images. And there was one like massive outlier of someone who had just not only did they label more images than anybody else, but they labeled them with incredible accuracy. Like they just, it was just absolutely like the number of classes per image was way higher than everybody else. The number of details, whatever. It turned out it was Antonio's mom who apparently was like this uh, fantastic labeler. But, um, you know, and that was the story. And then ImageNet came around and it seemed to, it, it won partly because I think of, uh, you know, the particular types of labels that it offered turned out to be very useful. It's called ImageNet because it connected to WordNet, which was a, a, a set of, uh, you know, a word ontology da database. It is still a word ontology database. So it had a very rich set of classes and it connected to huge data sets in Flickr. That was the other thing that sort of happened all at the same time. Okay. And what we got was a massive data set uh, originally for object, uh, uh, object detection, basically. So um, object recognition, object detection, the, you know, the basic difference between those <clears throat> is, um, you know, if you can say, you know, given an image uh, with a, let's say, I don't know, some goat or something in it, right? Uh, you can just say, you can ask the question, Given this image, does it have a goat? Yes or no, right? And uh, so that's sort of the image classification uh, problem. And then there's a, the object detection problem is a little bit more. It says, you know, is there a goat and show, give me a, a bounding box around the goat, okay? And you started seeing people with, um, with more and more recognition systems that would try to predict the bounding, a tight bounding box, 2D bounding box around a label, uh, an image. And the ImageNet data set contained um, 
two types of, of uh, labels, but uh, but the, maybe the more important part, a lot of the most of the images were labeled with this with these bounding boxes, and so they had uh, an interface on Mechanical Turk that allowed people to label um, bounding boxes and some and some heuristics to get crowdsourcing to be reliable, so that you could check bounding boxes across multiple labelers and make sure that you get reliable labels out without humans uh, supervising that labeling process. Um, <clears throat> oops. Just hit a button and lost my notes. One second. Okay, and so um, ImageNet was the thing that really, uh, you know, and the performance of deep learning networks against AlexNet and the like against the ImageNet was the thing that broke open computer vision and deep learning. But it's not really that useful or it, well, it wasn't enough that um, it's not exactly what we want for manipulation. The next class of algorithms, the next class of sort of data that people were able to generate, people started talking about segmentation, image segmentation, pixel wise segmentation. So. So you'd like to not only put a bounding box around the goat, but you'd like to have, um, you know, exactly every pixel labeled as goat or no goat. Okay. So you'd like to fill in, you know, exactly the pixels on the image that correspond to goats. And there were other data sets that came on Pascal and the like that, um, that started providing uh, first semantic segmentation. And then there's instance segmentation. This was really the Coco data set by Microsoft that broke this open. And the picture you should have in your head for this is uh, very intuitive once you see it, but right, so image recognition says, yes, there's some probability there's sheep, dogs, cats, and horses in here. Object detection is putting bounding boxes. Semantic segmentation says this is these are the colors of all the of all the dogs, these are the colors of all the sheep. Okay. Um, and then instance level segmentation uh, is is that you, every instance of the sheep is labeled with a different ID. Now imagine getting people to label this and the tools that were required, right? So it was really a fantastic thing that happened that I cost a lot of money, you know, got a lot of people to label a lot of images with high, high enough precision to make this Coco data set. And that broke open this world of instant segmentation. And instant segmentation turns out to be, I think, the sweet spot for, uh, for manipulation. That's, you know, that seems to be the thing that we needed the most in order to be able to, for instance, look into a pile of clutter and decide, I want to pick up the mustard bottle you know, I can, I can segment, you know, it encompasses object recognition, right? By having labeled this as a, as a certain color, it, it means I've done object recognition, object detection, but also at down to the pixel level, um, I can actually, you know, start picking things up. Russ, uh, just a reminder on the call up thing. Um, oh, thank you, good man. I'm trying to keep my GPU instance hot so that I can uh, I can show you guys some live stuff in a minute. Okay, so um, hopefully, I mean, I, I know that's super quick, but I think the ideas are pretty are pretty basic. You can do image recognition, object detection, semantic segmentation instant segmentation. And the amazing thing about that is not so much the problem formulation, but 
the ability it's you know you could have all you could, you could have proposed something different the thing that makes these the the right the winners is because there's a lot of labeled data for them okay now um the coco data set um which is still the one people use a lot uh, for instant segmentation. You know, it has uh, sheep, goats, giraffes, you name it, right? It has all kinds of weird stuff in it. It does not have spam cans, mustard, uh, you know, pot, I guess it's potted meat, not spam cans. It's Campbell's tomato soup. Um, right, and in practice, whatever you're actually interested in picking up, you know, maybe giraffes are exactly what you wanted to manipulate, but if it's not, then the question is, you know, what good does this COCO data set do for me if it's labeling a bunch of images in cl instance classes that are no good, that are not the things I want to manipulate. Now, here's the thing if you, uh, that's it's sort of mind blowing about deep learning, one of, one of the many things, right? Um, is this idea of fine tuning or retargeting, okay? So uh, <clears throat> it's, I'd say it's one of the most surprising results from deep perception. Um, and the, the, in, a, in, a, in a line, basically, somehow training on ImageNet and Coco, these general broad data sets that have lots of variety in them, all, like all the diversity that you might find on Flickr, seems to help us find features that work for picking up mustard bottles, okay? Um, it's crazy. So, um, so I think people have the general idea that I have an image coming in to some massive um, network with lots of layers, right? And it's never quite as simple as these pictures um, suggest. And at the last layer, there's something out, out here that um, says, what's the probability of being a dog? What's the probability of being a sheep? probability of being a giraffe, right? And somehow with training over these, these huge data sets, we're able to do very well in this task. Now the architectures that, that are used with convolutional layers and um, pooling layers and the like, have this interpretation that if you were to like examine the intermediate representations, they seem to learn relatively general features in the front end and then specialize to the final uh, outcomes of dogs, sheep, and giraffe, for instance, towards the end of the network. And here's like the crazy thing, still doesn't really, I, I still have a hard time sort of believing that it works as well as it does. If you just sort of lop that off, but keep the weights that you've trained on ImageNet and Coco, and now you have just a small data set that has you know, instances of mustard or whatever, but labeled instances of the things of the few objects that you care about. And you stick a new network on the end here, just a sub-network here, that's trying to outcome, output mustard, you know, potted meat, whatever. And a small amount of labeled data can get you incredibly good performance, right? If you were to train only on the, on a small amount of data for mustard, potted meat, in fact, um, it's not just like how many pictures you have, but it's somehow the diversity of the pictures you have. If I were to just generate the, the way I know how to generate, you know, the, these kind of objects, my, my perception performance would not be very good. But somehow by pre-training and using this part of the network that was trained on a massive, rich, diverse data set, it somehow allows me to retarget it to the objects I care about very quickly. Now that's awesome and enabling, okay? 
So <clears throat> good news, right? Um, now you only have to pay a little bit of money, right? To, to, to handful, you know, a handful of uh, mechanical Turk workers in order to label a, a smaller data set, right? Um, but actually, I mean, and, and there's whole companies that have the business model, which is basically like, you give me your small data set, I will write uh, the, the user interface so that we can put it on Mechanical Turk. I will curate the responses for you and give you back your labeled data, right? That's like a business model for Silicon Valley over the last five years or so is that there's a bunch of companies that will do that kind of thing for you for a, for a price. Um, but it still seemed to be the thing, you know, the thing for uh, probably not us uh, academics, right? So, uh, well, I mean, some academics have funded uh, those things, but it's not quite a commodity uh, tool yet. All right, enter simulation. This is where robotics has something to say because um, classically the computer vision world has been incredibly suspicious of simulated images. And I think rightly so. Uh, it's very hard, like I, I've said it over and over again, it's very hard to, I think it's, we can simulate any one thing even of incredible complexity very well. Uh, I don't doubt, I will, I will almost never bet against simulation in terms of, can you simulate X? I would say yes, in almost X, but <laughs> any X. But, but what's very hard from simulation is to get the diversity of, of Xs that the real world would give you. And uh, you know, there seems to be something magical about the diversity of images on Flickr that allowed us to get these more robust representations um, and people just don't think that you can get that out of purely simulated images, okay? But this, you know, when you combine this idea with the fine tuning and retargeting, now it starts to become really interesting because maybe I can take a small amount of simulated data, I can lean on the, the heavy pre-training on natural images and actually get a very, uh, you know, get somehow the best of both worlds. So, um, you know, in simulation, we can basically get rid of the labelers, right? We can render um, perfect uh, pixel-wise instance level, you name it, segmentations. Right? I can I can drop that um, clutter from the uh, from the sky, drop my cans into, into my, uh, my bin, come up with a rendered image. But if you look closely at the manipulation station and the other, even the RGBD camera sensors in Drake, you'll see that there was a color image output. There's a depth image output. And there was also a label image output okay it was it's it's sitting right there because it's such a, a, a powerful and useful uh, workflow um, so so now basically what I did last night um, you know I don't know what you guys if you did something more fun than me but I generated a bunch of uh, training data from dropping potted meat into our cans just use the clutter gen uh, and also generated all the labeled data. So let me kind of show you how that looks. You can, I, I verified that you could run this completely on um, Colab. So I'm going to give you the ability to basically completely reproduce this. But I chose to, I, I spent more of my time doing it locally just because uh, easier. Okay, so uh, this is what the this is what the output looks like, right? So we've already been showing you this, but if you take the labeled image uh, output port and you render it, then you get something that looks like this, okay? A perfect pixel-wise semantic level labeling of the image. And that's exactly the labels you needed in order to, to, to set up a, a massive instant segmentation pipeline. Now there's a there's one subtlety here that just just so you appreciate it, 
the um, you know the labeled images actually have like zero for all the background pixels, let's say, or and uh, one for the bin and two for, for this, right? And it out of a you know zero to two fifty five, or actually we we do it in int sixteen, so you can have more classes. Uh, if you were to just send to uh, matplotlib the image that you get out of label image, you will see a black image, right? It's not. Uh, it takes a little bit of post processing to to turn it into the colors you see there. You just take those small integers and turn them into interesting non-zero color values just to get some color diversity. But basically, this is almost exactly what you get out of the label imaging output port. And by default, if you do nothing else, you can go in and you can set the um, you can set the IDs for every object, every mesh geometry that's in your scene graph, and it'll render however you like. But the default ones, it just goes through, and as you've added them to scene graph, it said assigned a render label image of zero, one, two, three, right up, uh, and it basically gets you exactly what you need. Uh, you know, and you can just, I did, I made a data set where it just goes through, and every time. Um, I'm just doing it with the GUI turned on so you can see, but but it, I just basically made uh, 10,000 images uh, last night of perfectly labeled data for this, labeled with uh, you know spam cans and mustard bottles and, and Cheez-Its. Now I trained, um, to be honest, I trained on, I don't know, 1,890 images because I was, I, uh, I got tired and I, I didn't wait for the 10,000 to finish, but you, you, I have a 10,000 data set for you and uh, I'll show you results on, on the one I trained on uh, 1,890 images. And it's actually pretty good. Uh, and 10,000 is like a shot in the dark. I think people could, I think you could train um, even like the tutorials that people put on instant segmentation up on PyTorch. They use many fewer images than that, but they tend to train a small number of classes. Uh, 10,000 seemed like a, generous number considering I was training many classes uh, from the YCB objects. But uh, it's even that I think is probably overkill. I want to make sure I take questions if you have them. Could I could I ask more about uh, what is like the math required in, in the scene graph um, in the rendering stage that enables you to do this? Um, um, I mean, the math is not so interesting as the, um, but making it efficient is basically um, you're doing OpenGL, uh, you're trying to use the OpenGL to basically do your ray casting. So you don't want to ray cast and figure out which object do you hit, but you can you can basically use your depth buffer in OpenGL to tell you, you know, what is the what is the image that is being rendered in this pixel? And then you can take that that answer and, and change it over into your uh, rendered labeled coordinates. But it uses the same OpenGL backend as uh, the thing that's rendering colors. Is that what you wanted? Is that what you asked? I, I think so. I just, uh, think I need to look at the code just to. But yep. Yeah. I have a question okay. on uh, the idea that you can take out the last layer of a uh, data set. Um, that's trained on the image. Like, what's the intuition for being able to, if there is one that you can describe, because maybe not, um, for being able to take out the last layer and then replace it with your own smaller data set? Yeah, it really is um, inspired. And, and that people even talk about the architectures of the network as the backbone network and then the heads of the network, where they really think of the backbone as learning all the feature vectors. And they're learning features that are relatively less class specific. They're learning you know, the the deep equivalent of what a SIFT feature was or a SERF feature are these classical machine learning things. They're using, you know, convolutional layers and learned convolutional features and pooling and the like to generate some, you know, some of these magical features about natural images. And it's actually relatively only the last couple layers that um, that are converting that into a what's a dog, what's a cat, what's a sheep. But it's, but I'm, you know, it's still shocking. Like I, the fact that that works it, 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 without really explain, I mean, it's only through the architecture is that sort of imposed. It's not like there's a loss function in the middle saying, don't, don't pretend to, don't be dog specific. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, the way I've thought of it that's been useful for me to answer the question is, if you think about representational power, 
And so how good, how low can you get your loss function at the end of the day, if you get into the right local, local minima, hopefully the global, um, by having a, most things up until the last layer be more general, you have more information or more things contributing to each individual class. And so you've got more computation budget towards a final class by keeping everything gen more general and only focusing as you get towards the end. And that, so, so each individual label has more compute behind it, if you will, but it, it, that then gets forced to be balanced against each of these classes needing compute. And so it ends up leading to things that um, are useful across many classes in the early layers. Or at least that's my mental model of why it, we end up with this vague separation or gradient of generality. Do I know that that's actually true? No, but maybe the loss gradients do that for us by finding the, the better minimas have that property of, of having the, yeah. the, the early layers be more relevant. That's a, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know the right interpretation. I don't have any objections to that one. I, it, um, but, but it seems true that, I mean, People have inspected. You can go in and, and basically put a microscope under under what the features look like, deep, you know, in different layers in the network. And there is somehow uh, very systematic patterns that emerge from this that seem to follow this. That are uh, it really is um, a consistent, amazing phenomenon of the of these representations. Cool. Um, So let me give you a, a quick preview of basically what um, that looked like. So you can imagine I generated uh, you know, 10,000 images uh, and I used some of them. Okay, now um, I've got a training notebook, which I'll share all of these with you. That they, I, I did all my training on CoLab. I, I, I started it and uh, uh, went to bed and woke up and, and did an inference uh, in the morning, whatever, it's not fast, uh, but the fact that you can actually have GPU instances turned on. Um, if you look at the, uh, you know, the types of sessions that you're using in CoLab, normally you're using just a normal session, but these notebooks will turn, we turn on the GPU session, which happens in the sort of runtime, change runtime type. And uh, if you're not using the GPU, it will like squawk at you constantly. Uh, at some point you might run out of budget, but I, I don't, I don't know that you do. I think it's just, uh, I don't know exactly how the quotas are set up. I know there's a pro, pro version that gives you more GPU power, but it seemed plentiful, plentiful enough to, for me to do this sort of training. Okay, so um, I downloaded the bin picking model I did, and I, on one notebook, I trained it. Uh, on this one, I'm just gonna load the trained model. Now here's an interesting thing, which we'll come back to, but uh, you know, the, the total image data set, which I, I generated PNG images for the, um, for the RGB. I just used NumPy for, for my, uh, uh, I wasn't trying to compress or be efficient with my mask labels. I just dumped them into NumPy and I got some JSON files to talk about the instance labels. You know, that whole data set, the one I grabbed last night was 200 uh, megabytes. And the whole thing when I did the 10K was like 900 some megabytes. Now the deep learning, uh, model that I used, is, which is a uh, mask RCNN model. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. Uh, has a ResNet architecture. Okay, all these things are buzzwords I know, but it's got a lot of weights. There's a lot of elements in there. And just putting the the mask or the, the deep network weights into disk, that was 150 megabytes. So it's, it's almost as much as the, the data set. And that is a um, I and mean, sometimes it's actually more than the data set. If I had trained, uh, I could have trained the same network size with uh, with less images, and then I'd actually have a bigger neural network than I would have my whole data set. And that is a theme that we'll we'll talk a little bit more about. Okay, but I've got my um, my data set. Hopefully, this is still hot. Okay, um, let me just define the model. Oops, it's got. I forgot to download that. Okay, and um, I have this sort of massive neural network. We're gonna talk a little bit about the architecture. It's a mask RCNN network, okay? All of these are 
just massive numbers of weights of convolutional layers of uh, rectified linear units. Okay, and I don't, I, like I said, I don't really want to dwell on the architecture, but it's big. Okay, we're going to talk about the um, some of the key features of it. But if I now just take some random image from my data set, I open it and I push it through my model, then the output that comes out. I get a bunch of things. I get some bounding boxes because it is solving the object detection problem. It's, it's telling me the object bounding boxes. It's telling me the labels for each of those boxes, the now the class level label for each of those individual instances is found. And it's also giving me the masks, right? So the, 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 um, color, the pixel wise labels that it, it learned, okay? I will just draw that image for you. So this is a random one. It was image 438 from the data set. And you look at the learned masks, and here's, you know, mask zero. It found the mustard bottle, right? Just so cool. Um, I mean, this you could see if I just look at different sort of the different masks of the network. That's I guess a potted meat mask, and uh, I got look at mask number two, and it found my Domino's sugar box, right? On my Jello box, it's a crazy good, right? Uh, here is the object detection output, right? So, basically, uh, you know, French's mustard bottle. It, it came up with this bounding box. It's pretty darn tight, and the, you know, the instance level segmentation looked like a mustard bottle. If you look really closely at it, you'll find a few false positives. It like tried to write it. There's a couple extra objects in there that maybe aren't there. Um, but I actually, I mean, I, I didn't even really give it a fair chance. I, I cut my data set hard you know, fast because I was lazy. I didn't really normalize the pixels the way I should have. And um, you know, if, if you gave me like another night, it would be way better stuff. You know, so uh, this stuff is really good. It's really, really. It's almost frustrating how good it is. Um, Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about sort of this particular architecture. This particular architecture, this mask RCNN architecture, um, seems to be the one that people go to, certainly in robotics. Uh, I, I, you know, next year, who knows? Uh, and there's different versions of mask RCNN that have continued to evolve, and there's more details you can put in. But uh, this one seems to be pretty good. And let me show you before I go back to the to the uh, writing, just since I've got this screen, there's a couple, there's a really important um, idea about it, which is that um, the first part of the network takes an image in and generates a bunch of region proposals, okay? So it actually generates a thousand possible region proposals. Each of them are like potential bounding boxes. And I've just drawn the first 20 and they look kind of random and crazy. Okay, so remember that as we're going into the, um, you know, as we talk about the architecture, but just so I don't flip back and forth between the two, there's this sort of region proposal idea in the middle of it. Any questions about what you guys just saw? I think it's so cool that you can just do that. I mean, it used to be that even if you wanted to do deep learning, you had to have some big GPUs on your desk. And I mean, my laptop wouldn't cut it. Uh, I've got a pretty big machine over here that could do it, um, but it wasn't really commoditized. But things like Colab actually sort of commoditize deep learning. I think it's just so good. And if we combine that with, now we can put you know simulators up, up there. And I, I just think it's really a good thing for the world. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so the standard model I think I have in my head for a neural network, or you know, I think most people have in their um, head for a, a neural network, is you have some fixed length vector of inputs, right? And a fixed length vector of outputs. And you're learning a function that goes from, you know, basically you're trying to learn 
some big complicated function where x is some fixed vector. In our case, it's the image, right? Which is kind of squashed, if you would, uh, if you want, if you want to think about it in our normal vector notation. And then here, in the simplest case for like image classification, this could just be a vector which had the first one was really just the probability of a dog, probability of a cat. Okay. Now the things I just showed you for for uh, object even object detection. Uh, somehow there's a variable number of bounding boxes that come out the end. So what's happening there? That's like maybe the first thing to, to make sure we understand. So one thing that happened in, has ha happened in computer vision for a long time is if I take my image, it used to be that even when I wrote non-deep learning um, computer vision algorithms, you would tend to write an algorithm that would work, um, you know, work for some size of pixels. Let's say I, I would write something that would work for 28 by 28 um, pixels or, or something like this. And I would then apply it in windows of, uh, across my network. Maybe I would just, I'd have overlapping windows and I would run those same sort of algorithms that were based on a small part of my um, image and I would run them over and over again. And then maybe I would do it at multiple scales in multiple shifts. Okay, um, <clears throat> so so that you could find, you know, you, you'd like to have al uh, representations that are sort of uh, scale invariant, translation invariant, and things like this. And these were the initial ideas that got us that. Was these, you'd like to have the same kind of network that would be sort of give you answers, even if you shifted the image a little bit. Okay, but that could get really expensive, and it and it used to be that if people were running their um, computer vision algorithm, you know the the number of those regions would dominate the number of things they evaluated would dominate their running time, and it was very rare that we had like a high quality um, computer vision algorithm that could run like at real time rates for something we'd want for a robot. Uh, <clears throat> so there was even without deep learning, there was an advance in people trying to um, make proposal recommendations, uh, so, so region proposals. which would try to look at an image and basically pr produce a smaller set of boxes that might be interesting and relatively simple heuristics on color values and edges and other things could get us a smaller set of, um, you know, of boxes that, you know, you'd, you'd say, I'm gonna look over here, I'm gonna look over here, you should look at this. Um, and those, even in the first wave of deep learning, people used these sort of, um, region proposal front ends in order to generate um, you know, candidate regions, which you could then pass to a deep network. And if you write, if you just do inside here, you can just do um, object recognition. Is there a dog in this little box? Is there a sheep in this little box? Um, and that gets us pretty close. And if you if you now take that, you apply it to some subset of regions in our in our network, and you only output the ones that achieved some confidence level above 0.5, for instance, then that's where you started getting the outputs that looked familiar, where you see an image that has some variable number of boxes um, that are that are coming out, even though the networks were trained. On a, rel on a fixed size input and a fixed size output. There's also a bunch of magic that goes in to even to take variable size um, boxes like this and stretch and shrink them in order to, you know, and pixel wise interpolate them so that you can have a network of a constant size input, constant size output, evaluate um, regions of different sizes. So you can just train sort of one object recognition thing and share it for all of the different regions. Um, so that might work, but that might get you that somehow your object detection results, your bounding box results, are only going to be as good as your um, original region proposals. 
So people do a little bit more where they now not only output the object probabilities, but they, they output inside this box, a refinement of the box, of the bounding box. So inside this thing, I'll come, I'll come out with a, a network that says probability of dog, cat, you name it, and then uh, bounding box, uh, you know, min max basically. Four more numbers that come out, and that is going to be my refined. Um, bounding box here, you can just define it with two corners. And that's that allows these things to learn, you know, tighter, much, much more accurate bounding boxes. <clears throat> and that is a lot of what I just showed you is that we're actually just, um, you know, we're taking a region proposal, we're evaluate, we're training a classic object, um, object, uh, recognition system, object detection system inside it, okay? Uh, as, as things have gotten more advanced, our hand-designed region proposal networks have been replaced with deep region proposal networks now. So you'll see in the middle of that massive architecture, you'll see something called the Region Proposal Network, RPN. And actually of the massive size of the mask RCNN network that I just trained, uh, a big, big chunk of it is actually this front end, which is just using um, a, a, a ResNet uh, 101 to, and, uh, and a couple of other sort of fancy architecture things in order to cr create these region proposals and actually relatively smaller end on the end to do the object recognition and the object, um, uh, the bounding box refinement. Now, um, mask RCNN uh, does basically, there were a lot of people that were saying, how do I take in a system that works like this, which was state of the art for object detection and make it work for the harder problem of instance, uh, you know, semantic segmentation and then instance segmentation. And MaskR CNN proposed actually a very simple version of that, and it seems to be uh, best in class, uh, which is basically um, in parallel. With the object detection. We train uh, a mask network, which just takes a fully convolutional network, which takes in the entire image and outputs um, a binary mask for each, you know, for my dog or whatever, my giraffes, zero, one, okay. And it has a different binary mask for each uh, class. So. So it's a, it can output however many classes you have. It's going to output um, sort of a ridiculous number. I mean, when you when you think about what's happening in the runtime computations, and this is why GPUs are so important, like the number of uh, flops and the number of inputs and outputs is, you know, mind boggling. It's you know, I have like a network with four million outputs or something like this, right? My my output vector is four million, and that's actually a, a relatively small one by these by standard these days standards. Okay, so mask RCNN is uh, the idea that, you know, as far as I want to get into it, is roughly do your region proposal networks. Uh, and that's what I tried to show you. I showed you that it actually predicts 1000 uh, region proposals. Uh, they do, there's a, there's a bunch of heuristics to downsample that. If you look at the, how overlapping they are, there's, you'll, you'll hear about intersection uh, over union and other metrics that just say, are they overlapping a lot and keep things that are not overlapping, um, then you run your uh, you run your object detection network on it, and the ones that are most likely, you go through and you evaluate the masks for them. Okay, this is an inference 
time, you evaluate their masks. And then of the class that was highest, if I think the, the, that this box was likely a dog, then I will output only the mask as corresponding to the dog. The architecture, uh, you know, like I said, it's there's. I'm not sure that there's a ton to to learn or love about it, but there's um, a million details you could know, and you can crawl through the code. Um, I will also say that there are uh, open source implementations of this. I think that's one of the great things here. Um, I get. I'm doing a version in PyTorch uh, that I'll I'll share the code for. There's a new Facebook library uh, called Detectron Two. Detectron 2, which has, I think, the state-of-the-art mask RCNN implementation. I didn't use that. I went back to and used the Torch Vision original mask RCNN. Which I think has a few less of the bells and whistles. The total performance I can get out of it might be a little bit less, but my God, it's a lot easier to work with because I think uh, things just I think maybe it's a little over architected, but uh, things just got a lot more complicated in Detectron too. So for getting your head around it and for getting pretty darn good performance, uh, I went with Torch Vision, which is the older version. All right, quick seventh inning stretch here. Actually, I thought about downloading the music, but uh, I didn't. Any questions? How many people have used Mask RCNN before? By show of hands. Let's see if you could. All right. So, um, let me just dig in a little bit more and then I want to explore some of the, you know, the results and just think about the implications of having these kind of algorithms, right? So, um, you know, just to make sure we understand sort of, I think, you know, to some extent, you can't really learn from a lecture, uh, all the details that are here, you just have to hack on it, I, which I dislike, but I, I think that's maybe it's my inability to capture it. Um, but it feels like you just have to do it and we'll have you do some of it in the in a problem set. But um, you know, let, let's just make sure you understand sort of what does the data format look like? Okay. There's an interesting thing about working on look like. Um, there's an interesting thing about working on these deep learning systems, which almost everybody will say, you spend a lot of your time just converting your data into the right format for the network. And that's where all the bugs happen. Um, and you also hear people say that um, it's actually really hard to, to write good, to, to, to follow good engineering practices with these kind of things, because if you write your data converter, you know, I've, I've outputted my labeled images into some on-disk format. I wrote a, something that loads the images back in. I tried to compute the masks, bounding boxes, whatever. If I had a typo in that and I handed it to the deep learning framework, you know, the, the algorithms are strong and the learning curve is gonna go down, you know, and it's gonna learn something. And then it's just not gonna quite work. And you don't, it, it, there's, you know, when it doesn't work, what do you do? It's super frustrating. Or if it like works pretty well, but I kind of thought it would work a little better than that, you know, it's extremely hard to go back and figure out where you missed your minus sign or your plus sign, right? Um, and th that is one of the downsides of this. But uh, 
if you know, I've gone through some of the pain for you of, of, of curating the data. Hopefully I got my minus signs right. Um, so, you know, the input to this is an image, uh, simple three channels, uh, width and height. A uh, mask CNN is nice in compared to some of the other ones where the image doesn't have to be a particular size. You don't have to, um, you don't have to resize your images to be exactly the size of the network. If you change your image size, you don't have to retrain your network because it's doing these proposals and ship, um, you know, rescaling images for you in some of the early layers of the network. Okay. The output that you give for training and you get from inference time is the binary mask. Uh, for each instance. All right, so if I have multiple sheep, I get a different binary mask for every instance. And that is just labeled, uh, it could, sheep could be instance number three in, uh, in image 47, and it could be instance number seven in image 32. You know, there's no uh, necessary sort of ordering on the instances there. Um, we also have to tell it about a bounding box for each instance. And then we tell, uh, we give it sort of a map. Think of it as the Python dictionary for each instance to its class. So I basically say, you know, image uh, instance number three is a dog, instance number four is a sheep, so on and so forth. Okay. And that's roughly what you get back out of the network too. So um, if I go back now to my I find it super interesting to look at the, the details of some of the output, right? Um, what's the best way to do that? Right, so the prediction I got for that particular image is a bunch of boxes, right? The, these are the bounding boxes for each object instance, right? The label is just telling me which of the classes, which is an index into my YCB labeled objects. I chose to leave the background out, the bin out, um, right? And then these masks, which are images in and of themselves, they're binary masks. Let's poke around just a little bit more on it here. Oh, okay. So lots of cheese. It's there. I also managed to generate last night in one of my 1,890 images, something that had exactly one pixel of a tomato soup can, which uh, tested my, in my image parsing. So it had like, you know, there was like a little tomato soup can hiding through the corner, uh, which a bounding box, it didn't like bounding boxes of that size, but all right. So that's pretty good. I mean, it's, it gets a little bit messy there. Uh, that's a pretty awesome mustard label. I mean, that's fantastic, right? Like, how did it know that that was whatever it is that was this hiding below, right? Uh, like, I don't know if that's a Cheez-It box or a gelatin or whatever, but it might have gotten it right. Certainly labeled it well. Gelatin box, crazy, okay. And now you see that these are the um, region proposals I was talking about. Like I said, it proposes a thousand of them. It then uses a bunch of heuristics that you can sort of go through uh, in order to, to downsample them. Yeah, Dale. Uh, questions in chat. Oh, good, thank you. 
is there a link? There will be a link. I just want to, to clean it up a little bit. The, the biggest thing is I have to figure out where to host the data files. Um, I'm going to push it soon. And are the masks only zero or one can be values? Oh, good. Um, the training data I give it is masks between zero and one, but it outputs a probability, which uh, so it actually has a confidence, if you will. And that is one of the big things about um, that I think we should be thinking more about in terms of the manipulation side of it is um, it's very easy to just think of these as uh, as just thresholding the outputs and saying, you know, I've got an object here, I've got I don't have an object over here. But I think um, a lot of these perception systems now actually output confidence and thinking about how to bring that probability all the way through your manipulation pipeline is, you know, it's it's an easy thing to say. It's a hard thing to execute on, and we're only we're still we're still working on that. Any other questions here? Uh, I just had a random question, but um, I guess the masks that are generated are um, they take into consideration like the occlusion, so they, they only do the mask on the occluded parts of the object. Do you think it's like possible? Training data. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, you think it's possible to come up with some data set that kind of does shape completion as well? Kind of. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think. Um, I could have, so it's just a matter of how you uh, generate your training data, but uh, I think you could, if you trained binary masks, they had put binary masks out, which did the completion. I think the same architecture would probably, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure people have done that. I, I haven't seen that done exactly, but I would not be, I don't see anything about this architecture that wouldn't permit you to try to train on that. And I would be sort of optimistic, yeah. Right, so if you wanted it to output the entire gelatin box. Um, good, okay. All right, so what would we do, what can we do given we have um, this magical instance segmentation? Um, you know, we've alluded to the idea that segmentation would be useful a few times, right? So the first time we did it was in the pose estimation um, section, right? Even in the geometric pose estimation, outliers, um, you know, spurious uh, local, spurious points in my point cloud make that problem a lot harder. And the idea of trying to find a few good correspondences in like a huge scene, super hard, right? If you if you if I, if you give me like a point cloud for my entire uh, living room and you ask me to find the coffee mug, um, that's like a very very hard point cloud correspondence problem. But if I could just crop my point cloud, boom, down to the exactly the pixels that are correspond to my coffee mug, and I could, for instance, um, you know, Alex, for instance, if you were to take that, you could imagine your confidence on your correspondences if you for some of those networks could be uh, related to the probability of confidence that's coming out of my mask RCNN. So you could use this to do a weighted, let's say, point cloud correspondence. Um, and I think I, I think that is a good thing to do if what you need to do with your objects afterwards involves something about the pose of the objects, right? If you need to, for instance, <clears throat> you know, if you really need to understand the pose of the object in order to complete the task, for instance, if you wanted to plug the USB cable in and it needs to be in a particular orientation in order to accomplish the task, then you really need to think about the pose. Um, and and that, that's an approach that I think can be work, work very well. But I actually also really want to make the point that um, if you don't need the pose, 
don't ask for it because it's a lousy, I mean, those point cloud registration problems, although they're, they're fun to think about, they're really nasty problems. And the, all of the complexity of rotations and the like, if you don't need it, I would recommend not asking for it. So we also talked about, you know, antipodal grasps. And other sort of geometric based um, grasp planning algorithms. So there's a lot of really meaningful things you can do. If you were to just look into the bin and you, let's say you wanna grab the mustard bottles now and not the, the other bottles, it would be enough to segment your point cloud into saying, I wanna pick up this mustard bottle, give me the points relative to that. Don't try to reconstruct the pose, but do try to find now an antipodal grasp on that point cloud. And that turns out to be such a super useful capability that I, I really think that's why instant segmentation has come has come to be sort of a sweet spot for for a lot of robotics applications, even for other things like um, you know for loading dishes and the like. If you know exactly the mugs and plates and spoons that you are, are going to be manipulating and you have CAD models, then you can solve that problem. But if you um, you know if you need to solve a bigger class of just any old mug, any plate, any spoon then it's, a, I think, a really important question about whether you're trying to reconstruct the pose or whether you can get, a, get away without doing that. You know, I think dishes are somewhere in the middle because uh, you know, we do want to orient the plate in a certain way when we put it down. It's not enough to put it down like you know, flat. Somehow that orientation matters, but the symmetries don't matter, right? And there's a bunch of other parts of it that, that where pose is too much to ask for. Okay, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about putting these things together as systems uh, later. But but I think you can see that this is a very nice uh, you know first deep learning pipeline to go along with manipulation. All right, so let me talk about a few of the other um, you know big points here. So there's a there's a science of deep learning that's starting to happen now, which is super um, good, right? But one of the big themes there is over parameterization, right? I told you that my initial data set was 200 megabyte data set and I had 150 megabyte network. And sometimes those things go in the opposite direction. And there does seem to be something uh, magical about having this over parameterization that allows these what appear to be very non-convex uh, optimization problems to be solved reliably with gradient descent. And if you haven't been listening to the, that part of the conversation, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, you know, I've been paying attention to that um, conversation and I think it's incredibly good. We're starting to learn, uh, you know, different ways to think about optimization because of it. Uh, but there's, there's really interesting conversations happening about why over-parameterization makes these learning procedures, which seem like they should not be reliable, become reliable. And the fact, the fact that my worst complaint is that it's, it'll cover up my bugs because it still learns, that's a really nice place to be because it used to be, it just didn't learn, right? And my learning curve didn't go down. It actually, you know, it didn't work. Uh, <clears throat> so I would encourage you to, to, to look into the theory of deep learning, even though I won't cover it in the class. <clears throat> And as a particular you know, example, this isn't the, maybe the most theory, but there was a nice talk just yesterday uh, from the Embodied Intelligence Seminar that we call it the EI Seminar uh, on the uh, lottery ticket hypothesis. I, I've actually, so Mike Carbon gave that uh, talk. I didn't actually see yesterday's talk, but I've seen him talk about that a bunch of times. So I'm sure it was good, but um, you know, there's there's just really interesting things happening where people find out that that uh, for instance, the lottery ticket. Just to give you a taste of that, the lottery ticket hypothesis says that yes, I've got a 150 megabyte network. It turns out that if you were to take that network and and look at the weights, a lot of them are actually pretty close to zero. You can set them to zero. You can remove them from the network, train a, a little bit more, and actually get a much smaller network that that can perform as well. Um, but the really interesting, okay, I mean, I'll just 
just to, to go off on that for a second, the really interesting thing in the lottery ticket hypothesis is that um, the question is, could I have trained the sparse network from the beginning? Okay. So you take your network that has been compressed by setting the weights close to zero, and you put it back now to the initial weights that you started with, and you take your, your same training procedure and you train again. And it can discover that you could have trained that sparse network. But if you were to take go back to the initial beginning and you take your initial weights of your architecture and change the weights a little bit. So your initial starting point, which you think of as random, like I, I normally initialize my weights as like, a, I don't know, rand n times 0 0.01 or something like that. Okay, but if I, if I call rand n times 0 0.01 again, and I start with slightly different weights and I ask it to train the sparse architecture, then it can't. Okay, so there's like, we're, we're starting to learn all the magical recipes. It seems like having lots of parameters allows us to find some particular path through this super high dimensional space in these interpolating solutions and the like, okay? And if you were to start from a slightly different place, it, it doesn't work. So it's a great time for, for machine learning because we're really, we're starting to understand these things better. Um, you know, it's not all good news, right? So I do think, um, I do think it's harder to, to, to do proper engineering, right? Um, if it doesn't work, what do you do, right? Um, and it's very frustrating, I think, once you get into that situation. One of the amazing things about these is that you can, uh, it, it tends to be the case that uh, if I've trained a system with some amount of data and I go off and start testing it and I find uh, places where it fails, if I can capture that failure, label the data and put it back into my uh, training set and train a little more, I can often fix that problem and keep working, which is super awesome. But when it's not working, it's just very hard to do controlled experiments to debug the network. And you know, training these things takes uh, days potentially, certainly hours, uh, used to be months. And, um, you know, I remember thinking it sort of wasn't fair, right? Because I was, I was trying to solve semi-definite programs and I was dissatisfied if they took more than a minute and a half. And I, um, and then, and then I'm like suddenly being compared against people that are spending three months on a, on a supercomputer to train their, their, you know, to do their optimization. And there was a time when I, um, you know, I wasn't as, as sure what was happening in the deep learning where I was like, oh, that's not even cool, man. I'm, I'm like, um, I'm not giving myself a fair fight. <clears throat> okay, the other sort of, I think important thing to know is that it really defeats, um, there's, a, there's a knowledge that's coming up about, it defeats standard engineering abstractions. Uh, and, and I think there's there's like there's a Google course on how do you do good engineering with machine learning that it, it is actually a great. I'll, I'll I'll link that from the notes. But um, you know the problem is if I do like a perception system here and then a planning system here and a control system here. You know we like to build these engineering architectures and we use the systems framework so that I can, for instance, write a different planning system pop it out, pop it back in, and all is well. And the problem is when we start using learning for each of these components, if the data that you use to train this was captured in a closed loop setting, then even if you've tried to make some barriers between these, the data causes these sort of creeping dependencies, okay, where you cannot just simply remove your planning system and put a new one in because the way your perception system worked sort of depended in some you know insidious way on the the data and the planner that you had used before, so I think there's a big challenge of sort of getting better about engineering with these things. And then um, I, I I sort of guessed that Daniel might ask this, so so let me uh, uh, let me address maybe one more thing. So one of the things that, about this mask RCNN is. Um, you might ask, 
why only RGB? And this is a good question. This is like what roboticists talk about what, at parties, you know, is like, uh, uh, why, why we have this great depth sensor, right? And, and we're trying to do segmentation. Why would you not like feed the depth input also into your deep network, right? What do you think? What do people think? Have you guys had a party where you talked about this? My, my intuition is that the depth signal is much noisier, but I haven't played around with it or tested it or things like that. But that would be my, if I had to, to take a guess, that, that'd be it. Yeah. Now for depth, people are using um, like point net and point net variations a lot instead of like mask our CNN based architectures for future extraction. Yes, I think there are networks that do use it, but mm -hmm. uh, because humans only have RGB. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, well, okay, so actually the way that I agree with Julius's version here is that um, I think it's because we have Flickr for RGB, right? I think we have massive data for RGB. And PointNet and other things are, um, you know, they're trained on much smaller, much less diverse data sets, right? So I, I, I actually, if I had to put my chips down, I would say maybe it's because we don't have Coco or we don't have ImageNet for RGB D. Sorry, um, you know, and maybe when we do, if we could do pre-training on a, on a network that uh, that actually had depth too, then maybe it would surpass these capabilities. People certainly do know how to have yes. Um, we people we do, people definitely have versions of how do you do depth. You could put two images uh, together and pass that into your deep network. You could put your image and your depth image together. You could put it as a you can put shove a point cloud through and do three D convolutions. It's not that we don't know how to stick three uh, D data into a, a deep network. Um, people argue that you we did, that the three D convolutions aren't as good and stuff like that. But I think there's enough ways that people have tried to do that that I doubt that's the actual bottleneck. Um, it might be like Dale says that the, no the system, the, no the data is just noisier um, uh, or, or we just don't have enough of it. I don't know. All right, that was round one of, um, of, of deep perception. We'll do a few more versions of it uh, throughout the class. The instance segmentation is the first, I think, beautiful application of a purely perception, you know, train purely on perception uh, and get something super useful for a full stack manipulation. Cool. Uh, no class on Tuesday, right? I think it's, um, it's not Columbus Day, it's Indigenous People's Day, I believe, on Monday. And uh, that means Tuesday classes are a Monday class, Monday schedule, which means we don't get to have a lecture and why we'll see you a week from today. Good, see you then. Thank you. I'll, I'll hang out for a minute if anybody has, oh, I forgot the survey, damn it. Can I see the... Uh... The mustard mask again. Um, I don't know if you have that on. I was just curious how how crisp the segmentations seem like you're getting some. Um, something I mean, the image has more mustard. It was pretty good. I mean, considering how. Uh, let's see if we get a good one. I'm not going to find it, but um, there was actually 